Several weeks ago, we began a series on the family. Now, this series is special because we have only done it when we live stream our church services. And the series on the family, we began with a message entitled, Desperate Housewives. Remember that one? The message was directed to husbands, to Christian married men. Following that message was a second part, a week or so later, and it was entitled, Frankenstein's Monster. That was a message that was directed to Christian wives. So we discovered that the Bible had a clear message for husbands and wives. And in both of these messages, we specifically talked about God's order in the home. In both of these messages, we began in the book of Genesis, and we made our way to the New Testament. Oh, we covered some sensitive subjects. We sailed some rough seas, but we allowed God to be God and His Word to be authoritative and final. Each of these messages had three timeless biblical principles. The three principles for husbands were, number one, ultimate responsibility lies with the husband, with the man, not with the woman. Even though the woman was first in sin, God addressed himself not to the one who was first in sin, but God addressed himself to the man. Point number two, complementarity. Man was created for partnership. After God created man, he put him back to sleep and he finished the job. And number three, love is the crowning virtue in the marriage relationship. Men are commanded to love their wives. They're to be considerate to their wives. They're to treat them with respect, the Bible says, so that their prayers not be hindered. We also discovered that in God's order of the home, that the husband is the head of the wife. Some men might be tempted to think that this means extra privileges. What it really means is extra. Anybody remember? responsibility. That's right. We concluded with an appeal for husbands to be the leader of love in their homes, cutting off everything that they were doing to betray their wives. The second message, Frankenstein's monster, was directed to Christian wives. We discovered three principles paralleling those found for men. Satan disrupted God's order in the home. In the Garden of Eden, we see God's perfect order where you have the Creator, God communicating directly with Adam, who had Eve right beside him. But in Satan's distortion of God's order, we see Satan not communicating with Adam as God had ordained, but communicating directly to Eve, who then brings the man by her side, and together they eat of the forbidden tree. So the first point for wives was to recognize and return to God's order for the family. Leaving Genesis, we move to Ephesians chapter 5. It's that same passage that commands husbands to love their wives as God loved the church. Not once or twice, but four times it commands husbands to love their wives. This passage also had a message for Christian wives. We boiled it down to two words, respect and submit. They were to respect their own husbands and submit to their own husbands. And then we went to Colossians chapter 3, verse 18, and we added an addendum to that point, as is fitting in the Lord. We drew a contrast between the God-ordained voluntary submission of a wife to her husband between the forced oppression of women by men. God would never sanction the abuse of a single woman. God will hold men accountable for how they treat their wives. Genuine submission cannot be forced or enforced. Submission of a wife to her husband does not degrade the wife or make her of less value any more than Jesus is a lesser God when he submits to his father. We concluded that wives have a powerful influence over their husbands, either for good or for bad. We concluded that wives who disrespect and nag their husbands, and they actually have a hand in creating their own monster, as certainly as Frankenstein created his. And so, concluded our two-part series on the family? Nope. 
Today, ladies and gentlemen, we have part number three, nails in the post. Would you bow your heads with me as we ask God's presence to be with us once again? Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your word. Lord, sometimes we find challenging subjects in your word. Give us the understanding and the grace and, most of all, your ability to put the things we learn into practice so that our homes can be happy and ordered after your pattern. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Nails in the post. Today, our message is directed to children. And I am glad we have... How many children here today? How many children do we have? Someone said four, and that would be, that would be a five. Well, I think we have more children than that. Because the reality is, is that all of us are children. If we're not children of earthly parents, maybe your mom and dad have passed away, perhaps, but we're all children of our heavenly Father. Now, um, many have uh, been waiting for, perhaps, to this message that I was going to preach on children. Maybe some of you here feel that your kids are rebellious. Maybe you have uh, teenage children or, or children who have left home or, or grandkids. Now, I don't know, but in any case, I saw value in today in preaching a message directed to children. Now, it makes sense to preach a message directed to children because we discover that the self-same passages that we looked at in the last few weeks at messages for men and messages for women, these self-same passages also address children. God's Word had a clear message for men. It had a clear message for women. Does it also speak to children? I believe it does. And let me preface my message by reiterating what I already stated. We are all children. We all have parents. Some of our parents may no longer be alive, but even so, I encourage you to pay attention today because we, as we discuss and as we examine the parent-child relationship, we will recognize that we are all children of the Heavenly Father. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 2 says, Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord has spoken. I have nourished and brought up children, and they have what? Rebelled against me. Today, as I speak to the children of human parents, I pray that the message will lose none of its effect as a message also to the children of our Heavenly Father. And just as the messages for husbands and wives each contain three points, Today, we will also discover three biblical principles for children. First, we go not to Genesis, because in the very beginning of Genesis, there weren't any children yet, but we go to the book of Exodus. Exodus chapter 20 and verse 12. Some of you probably already recognize that this is the Ten Commandments chapter. Exodus chapter 20 and verse 12. The scripture says, honor your father and your mother that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God is giving you. Our first point from scriptures, number one, is that children are to honor their parents. Now, this is special. None of the points that we made for husbands or wives came directly from the Ten Commandments. However, on this message for children, point number one is right out of the big ten. It's the fifth commandment, right in the middle. The fifth commandment is at the top of the second tablet. As many of you know, the ten commandments were given on two tablets. The first tablet contains the first four commandments that tells us about our relationship to God. The second tablet, containing the last six commandments, tells us about our relationship to our fellow human beings. First four, how to love God. Last six, how to love man. That's why in the New Testament, when someone asked Jesus, which is the greatest commandment, Jesus replied, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. 
And the second is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And then he says, on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. The Ten Commandments hang from these two commands, love to God and love to man, much like our ten fingers hang from our two arms. And so we ask ourselves, what is the function? What is the function of the Fifth Commandment, the one about honoring our parents? Now, the first tablet began with our relationship to our Heavenly Father. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make idols and so forth. The second tablet begins not with our relationship to our heavenly father, but with our relationship to our earthly father and mother. What we can say then is that this commandment is in the middle of loving God and loving man. It is a link that links up the two tablets together. Well, the fourth commandment is the forgotten commandment. Remember, you know that one's forgotten. The fifth commandment is the ignored commandment. Honor your father and your mother. What does honor mean? Webster's Dictionary defines the verb to honor this way, to regard or treat someone with respect and admiration, to show admiration for someone, especially in a public way, to do something that is required, something such as fulfilling a promise or a contract. Now, I have to say that honoring their parents is something that a lot of children have difficulty these days, especially teenagers. Now, I'm not picking on teenagers, but, you know, I just escaped being a teen myself not that horribly long ago, 15 years ago. And I can talk from personal experience, because I remember those years very well. Maybe some of you do as well. One man said, when I was a boy of 14, my father was so ignorant I could hardly stand to be around the old man. But by the time I was 21, I was astonished at how much he had learned in seven years. I think it's easy to think that we know better than our parents. But most parents love their children more than we can ever know. I could never have imagined how much my parents loved me until I had children of my own. Then I understood When I tell my daughter, no, you can't do that, she's probably thinking, Dad, what a killjoy you are. Children, you are to treat your parents, your father and your mother, with respect and admiration. Not your father or your mother, but your father and your mother. This is a serious issue, by the way. This is one of the Ten Commandments. Back in the Old Testament days, under the theocracy, breaking any of the Ten Commandments was punishable by death. Turn just a few pages ahead in your Bibles to Exodus chapter 21 and verse 17. You're in Exodus chapter 20. Just go a a few pages ahead to Exodus chapter 21 and verse 17. It says, And he who curses his father or his mother shall surely, what does it say? Be put to death. That's a pretty serious issue, isn't it? That's pretty serious. This is a capital offense in the Old Testament. We look again at this commandment, Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God is giving you. Now, just a few minutes ago, we went to Webster's Dictionary to learn what honor meant. And for those of you who are Bible students, you know that you don't understand the Bible by studying Webster's Dictionary. You go, if you really want to understand what it's talking about, you go to the original languages of the Greek and the Hebrew. So that's what I did. The verb honor in Hebrew is kaved. It comes from the root word, which means to be heavy or give weight to something. Maybe you've used the expression, that doesn't carry any weight with me. Your parents should carry weight with you. The word honor means to value like a heavy coin, a coin that was rare and valuable in biblical times. Think of a scale or a balance. When you cavade something, you give more weight to it. You give more preference to it. The Bible tells us that we should give preference and deference to our parents. We may not feel they're worthy of honor, but that doesn't matter. 
Your parents aren't perfect. They've been alive longer to sin longer than you have. We're all sinners. Yet the Bible says that we are to honor our father and our mother. By the position as parents, we are obligated to give them weight. Honor them. Our parents are an authority that God has put in charge of us while we're living in the home. You're not the boss in the home. You don't call the shots in the home. The verb to honor in the commandment is, we're going deep into the original languages now, is in the PL stem, which means that this is an intensive form of the verb. Now, maybe you didn't think you were going to get a grammar lesson this morning, but an intensive form of a verb, how does that differ from a regular verb? Here are some examples. A regular verb, to break. The intensive form of to break would be to shatter. The regular form of the verb, to kill. The intensive form of to kill would be to slaughter. You get the idea. The commandments isn't telling us to merely respect our parents, but it's telling us to honor them intensely. The Hebrew form of the verb also denotes ongoing action. Not honoring them once and then stopping, giving them a birthday card or a Christmas card or something. But no, this is ongoing action. Don't stop honoring them. When you are a child living in your parents' home, honoring them means doing what you are told with a good attitude. This commandment doesn't say obey your parents. Notice it didn't say that, but it's most certainly implied. It is possible, by the way, to obey someone without honoring them. If you take out the trash, sneering and complaining the whole way in your heart, you may be obeying, but you're certainly not honoring. And God says your parents deserve honor. If you disrespect your parents, you disrespect God who gave them to you. If you talk back to them and you say bad things behind their back or you roll your eyes at them or you wish you had different parents, you are not honoring them. If you argue with mom and dad, you lie to them, you manipulate them to get your way, you are not honoring them. Even when you leave home and get married and start a new home of your own, you can still honor and respect your parents. When your parents are advanced in years and need your help, you're obligated to take care of them. They took care of you when you couldn't clothe yourself or feed yourself. Someday it will be your turn to take care of them. In doing so, God has placed with children the divine responsibility of caring for their parents when they get old. Paul encourages children and grandchildren to make some return to their parents that is pleasing in the sight of God. 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 8 says, But if anyone does not provide for his relatives and especially for the members of his household, he has denied the faith, And is worse than a what? Worse than an unbeliever. Leviticus chapter 19, verse 32. You shall stand up before the gray head and honor the face of an old man. Proverbs chapter 23, verse 22 adds, And do not despise your mother when she is old. When Jesus was on the cross, he thought of his mother. In John chapter 19, verse 27, he said, he said to the disciple, which was the disciple John, Behold your mother, and from that hour the disciple took her to his own home. Think about that. When Jesus was on the cross, I mean, he had so much going on in his mind, the hurt, the pain, the sacrifice, giving his life for the, for the whole world. And what did he do? He thought of his mother. God has given us the divine responsibility, the incredible honor of taking care of our parents. But too often children think it's too much of a hassle to take care of mom and dad, too much of an inconvenience. Instead of taking them into our own homes, as did John, whenever that's possible and safe and feasible, we put them in retirement communities or nursing homes, sometimes against their will. I know that's our culture. Send our kids to daycare when they're young. Send our parents to nursing homes when they're old. But our culture may not be in harmony with the Word of God. And when Scripture and culture conflict, what must remain supreme? The Scripture must remain supreme. 
honor your father and your mother. What does it say? That your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God is giving you. Want to live a long time? Honor your parents. I don't know about you, but I want to live a long time. I have enough dreams and plans for five lifetimes. Now, this doesn't mean that if you honor your parents, you're going to live another 50 years or another 100 years, but think about it. What land is God giving us? As nice as Michigan is, this world is not my home, as the old song says. I'm just passing through. When we honor our parents, it develops within us those characteristics that help us honor God. It prepares us to live in the new earth that God is preparing for us where we will live eternally, that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God is giving you. Patriarchs and Prophets has this to say, beginning on page 308, parents are entitled to a degree of love and respect which is due to no other person. God himself, who has placed upon them a responsibility for the souls committed to their charge, has ordained that during the earlier years of life, parents shall stand in the place of God to their children. Now that's an interesting statement, very, very interesting statement. But notice it has a qualifier in front of it. What times during the earlier years of their life they stand in the place of God to their children? And he who rejects the rightful authority of his parents is rejecting the authority of God. The fifth commandment requires children not only to yield respect, submission, and obedience to their parents, but also to give them love and tenderness, to lighten their cares, to guard their reputation, and to succor and comfort them in old age. This, says the apostle, is the first commandment with promise. To Israel, expecting soon to enter Canaan, it was a pledge to the obedient of a long life in that good land. But it has a wider meaning, including all the Israel of God, and promising eternal life upon the earth when it shall be freed from the curse of sin. So that is our first point, that we should honor our parents. Now, don't worry, the second two points aren't going to take quite as long as the first one, so we're not going to be here all day. But our second point today for Christian children comes from the book of Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 13, verse 1, as paraphrased by Eugene Peterson. Intelligent children listen to their parents. Foolish children do their own thing. While that's not an exact word-for-word translation, I can tell you that's exactly what Solomon was trying to get across in his book. So our second point for children is that they should listen to their parents' instruction. Do you hear? Proverbs chapter 1, verse 8 says, Hear, my son, your father's instruction, and forsake not your mother's instruction teaching. Let's open our Bibles to Proverbs chapter 4. Proverbs has a lot of wisdom in it, written, of course, by, compiled by King Solomon. Proverbs chapter 4, verses 1 through 4. Hear, my children, the instruction of a father, and give attention to no understanding, for I give you good doctrine. Do not forsake my law. When I was my father's son, tender and the only one in the sight of my mother, he also taught me and said to me, Let your heart retain my words, keep my commands, and live. So the Bible says that kids should listen to their parents' instruction. Proverbs 1, verse 8, Hear, my son, your father's instruction, and forsake not your mother's teaching. Now the word here in Hebrew is shama. Now, I will never forget that word, and the reason why, it wasn't that many years ago when I was in college and I was taking Hebrew. And part of taking Hebrew was that I had to memorize, I don't know how many words, but it was a lot of words. I had to memorize the vocabulary of Hebrew. I had to memorize all these words. And Shema was the word here. And I had to memorize it, but I gave myself a mnemonic device. Do you know what a mnemonic device is? I'll give you an example. You shama your mama. You listen to your mother. You shama your mama. Now you'll remember the Hebrew word now, won't you? Shama means to listen. But it means to listen and hear with attention and interest, to heed and agree with. 
A good way to think of Shema is a mathematical equation. Hear plus do. The English translation doesn't bring this across very well, but this is exactly what the Hebrew means. You hear what your parents are saying, you agree with it, and you do it. But why? Why should you listen to what mom and dad have to say? Well, let's open our Bibles to Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 6 and 7. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 6 and 7. Now, you may recall the context around Deuteronomy chapter 6. Can anyone tell me what happened in Deuteronomy chapter 5? In Deuteronomy chapter 5, you have the second giving of the Ten Commandments. Remember Moses? Remember he smashed the first tablets, so God had to give him a second one? So in, in Deuteronomy chapter 5, you have the second giving of the Ten Commandments. And in Deuteronomy chapter 6, God is giving instruction about those Ten Commandments. So we read in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 6 and 7, And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart, and you shall teach them diligently to your children, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. Your parents have been commanded by God to instruct you, that is the children, to bring their children up in the commandments of God. That is why you should listen to them. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4 commands parents concerning their children to bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Just as it is the God-ordained responsibility for parents to teach their children, it is likewise important for children to listen to their parents' instruction and take it to heart. God doesn't command children to listen to their iPhone or their iPad or to the television or to their friends or to grandpa and grandma. God commands them to listen to their parents. And now point number three. This one is probably the hardest one for kids nowadays. We open our Bibles to Colossians chapter 3, verses 18 through 21. You may recall that we went to this exact passage when we were preaching to husbands and wives, when we were preaching to men and women. Now we go to the same passage for children. Colossians chapter 3, verses 18 through 21. Verse 18 was for wives. Wives, submit to your own husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Verse 19 was for husbands. Husbands, love your wives and do not be bitter toward them. Verse 20 now is for the children. Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing to the Lord. Fathers, do not provoke your children, lest they become discouraged. So we see here that parents must obey their parents in all things. Wow, that's pretty, that's pretty plain, isn't it? Obey your parents in all things. Wow, not in some things, but in all things. Even if it seems dumb, even if it seems unfair even if it seems unpleasant. Of course, Paul is assuming that your parents would not ask you to do something that is not in harmony with God's word. This same threefold pattern of speaking to husbands, wives, and then third to children can be found in Ephesians chapter 6. Let's go there. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 1 to 3. We read this passage for husbands. We also read it for the wives. Now we read it for the children as well. Ephesians chapter 6, beginning in verse 1. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Verse 2. Honor your father and your mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with you, and you may live long on the earth. Now, verse 4 is good too, and I could preach a whole sermon on that one, but that's not what I'm talking about Today, today is a message for children. So point number three is children should obey their parents. Did you know that disobedience to parents is one of the signs of the last days? Along with wars and rumors of wars, along with pestilences like COVID, along with earthquakes and tornadoes and tsunamis, along with violence and the love of many growing cold, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 and 2 tells us, 
But know this, that in the last days perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves. Lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, and the list goes on. One mother, when she, asked, when she was asked by her three children what she would like for her birthday, she said, I would like, after she thought about it for a moment, I would like three obedient children. One of the children thought about her words for a moment and said, Great! That means there will be six of us. God gives a high priority to obedience. The Bible doesn't tell us much about Jesus' upbringing before his public ministry. We see him in Bethlehem's manger. We catch a glimpse of him in the temple when he's 12 years old. We see him when he's getting baptized. But there is one reference to Jesus' behavior as a child, and that's found in Luke chapter 2. It's around the story when Jesus was left behind at the temple and Mary and Joseph didn't know he was missing for three days. And after this, the Bible says in Luke chapter 2, verse 51, and he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was submissive to them. If anybody knew better than his parents, it would have been Jesus. He was God. Yet Jesus was obedient and submissive to his parents. Think about that for a moment. Jesus, who was perfect, was obedient to imperfect parents. Jesus, the one who created all things, the one at whose feet angels sing, holy, 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 the one who flung the stars into existence, was obedient to his parents, was submissive to his parents. Because it is right. Just like it's right for all children to show submission by obeying their parents today. I don't care if it's not cool. I don't care if it's not what the other kids are doing. I don't care if it seems incredibly unfair. The Bible says that for children living under the authority of their parents in their home, obeying them is right. In all cases, except abuse, obeying your parents in the Lord is right. Submissive children obey their parents What's fascinating here is that the Greek word to submit here in Luke chapter 2, where it says that that Jesus was submissive to his parents, is the exact same Greek word submit that we've been studying in the earlier message directed to men and women when wives are to submit to their husbands. That's fascinating. As we wrap up this series on the family, we could say it is the saga of submission. Jesus submits to the Father. Husbands are to submit to Christ. Wives are to submit to their husbands. And children are to submit to their parents, both mom and dad. It is the saga of submission. Now, before we close, I need to touch on a subject that may not be popular with some parents, but I need to touch on it because it's true. Children while they're living in the home, while they're living under the parents' roof, while they're living at home with mom and dad, are biblically required to submit and obey their parents in everything. But when children leave home, this changes, according to the Bible. You don't believe me? Let's open our Bibles to Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 31. Ephesians chapter 5 Verse 31. The Bible says, quoting the Old Testament, for this reason a man, or actually quoting Jesus, I should say, for this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and shall be joined to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. There is an important word very important word, and that is leave. Leave. When you leave home and you get married, loyalties change. When we leave the authority of our parents and cleave to the authority of our homes, things change. A daughter submits to her new husband. That's why fathers give their daughters away 
at a wedding. A son now submits to Christ. A man cannot serve two masters. His loyalty is to Christ and to his own home. Some parents listening today, you need to learn to let go. Your children are not always going to make the decisions that you would have them make. They may even turn away from Jesus. But there comes a point when they must make their own decisions and live or die by them. You are not responsible for them when they leave home. You had them for a few years. That's why training your children is so important when they're young. This, of course, doesn't mean that adult children aren't supposed to respect and listen to the advice of their parents. It simply means that loyalties have changed. The allegiance has change that has taken place, change has taken place. Now, as we look at the three points, the first two are timeless, okay? The first two are timeless. They do not change when you leave home. You should always honor your parents. You should always listen to them. And concerning the third point about obeying your parents, remember that while you may not be living in your earthly parents' home, you're always living in God's home. Remember Psalm 23? I will dwell in the house of of the Lord forever. Once upon a time, there was a boy who was rebelling against his dad constantly. The boy was destroying his own life. He refused to heed his father's words. One day, the dad said to the boy, I want to show you what you're doing to your life. I'm going to put a wooden post in the front yard. Every time you rebel... I'm going to put a nail in the post. Every time you obey, I'm going to pull a nail out of the post. The boy thought about it, and he thought, I'm going to do everything I can to fill that post up full of nails. In two months' time, the post was covered in nails. But he also began to feel the damage he was doing to himself and to his parents. With true remorse, he made a change and began to obey his father. One by one, the nails came out. When the last nail came out of the post, the boy broke down in tears. The dad asked, son, why are you crying? He said, I got rid of the nails, but I couldn't get rid of the holes. Jesus' hands will always have the scars, reminding me of the nails that I have driven 2,000 years ago, on a hill called Calvary, nails were driven into an old rugged cross because of my rebellion, because of my disobedience. Because of those nails, I'm forgiven. But hear the heartbreak of our Father in heaven as he says, a son honors his father and a servant his master. If then I am the father, where is my honor? If I am a master, where is my reverence, says the Lord of hosts. A spirit-filled home only requires two things. Children who are submissive to their parents and parents who are submissive to the Lord. But did you notice something? Did you notice that the qualities for submissive children are the same qualities that we should have as submissive children of our Heavenly Father? The qualities of honoring listening, and obeying. So let me ask you, are you obedient to God? Do you listen to Him? Do you obey Him?